Bonjour, nous avons aujourd'hui absinthe, comme ça. Now that I've spilled it all over the place, <laughs> I'm trying to show you how to do a louche. Let's see if we can get this again. Hang on one second. I didn't realize this would be impossible to pour out of, but okay, hang on. There's the absinthe. Look closely at the little clouds that are rolling around in there. See them on the bottom, the white clouds? Go on, hang on one more. Here we go. Beautiful. That's called the louche. That's the green fairy underneath. Okay, so um, I actually prefer it without sugar, so I'm gonna do it as is. So there is probably no drink that is more maligned, misunderstood, fetishized, and of course criminalized than absinthe. There's no drink that has inspired more poets and painters and thinkers. And there is no drink with a more fascinating history. Um, and in my humble opinion, there is no drink that approaches its complexity and refinement and uh, though its reputation, as we will see, is quite otherwise. Um, now the question is, what is this weird stuff that I'm sipping right now? Absinthe is extraordinarily potent. It's actually the strongest alcohol you can buy, just in terms of percentage. Um, it's usually actually based on grain. A few are grape-based, um, and they usually range from 45 to about 75% alcohol. I've even had a um, one that's 82% alcohol, which is a Blanche Traditionnelle Brut d'Alambic, which means that just as it comes out of the Alembic still, that's the way they sell it. Um, so it's, it's about twice as strong as vodka, okay? So this is about the equivalent of four shots or so. So if you're wondering um, if I get a little incoherent by the end of this lecture, you'll, you'll understand why. <laughs> it's, um, so the, um, the key to uh, absinthe, very much like other drinks, is usually one in particular, one uh, flavoring in particular. And in this case, it is wormwood, okay? named so-called uh, because... It uh, was used to chase worms from uh, people's bodies if they had worms in their stomachs. You take wormwood and it flushes it out because it's very, very bitter on its own. The uh, herb is called Artemisia absinthum, which is where the uh, word absinthe comes from. Artemisia is a whole family of uh, herbs, which you can, you can grow very easily, actually, in California. Um, there are also other aromatic herbs in here. There's usually hyssop. There's usually anise, sometimes fennel. Um, Maybe Angelica, Veronica, Melissa, aren't those all sweet names, <laughs> but they're also herbs. Um, and so it has a vaguely, people often say it it's sort of has a licorice flavor. It's not licorice at all. It's almost, almost never licorice. It's usually not star anise either, which is very licorice-y. But the overwhelming taste, in the good stuff at least, is the slightly bitter wormwood, um, which, is not, which really doesn't taste like, like uh, licorice at all. Um, in some, you'll find it's this weird greenish color. Um, the better ones, the ones that come from um, the Val de Travers in Switzerland, are blue. And of course, of course they're called Swiss blue uh, for that reason. And uh, it all has to do with the herbs that are put in, um, usually after distillation, okay? What's uh, kind of interesting is people think the herbs are put in during the distillation, but there would be no color then if it was distilled. So this is afterwards. Uh, and the uh, color, the, it's nick the nickname comes from the color La Fée Verte, which means the green fairy uh, in French, and this is obviously green and um, 
and the good stuff is. There's, there's also very bad stuff that tastes like mouthwash. <laughs> um, but anyway, we'll talk about the good stuff. So supposedly, and I say this um, because there's still a great deal of argument about it, the active ingredient in absinthe is said to be thujone, okay? which is, is uh, long held to be a psychoactive drug. Um, and there are people who will tell you, um, some detractors, that the effects of thujone are wildly exaggerated, if not completely false. Um, it is not hallucinogenic. No matter what anyone tells you, you're not going to see, see uh, visions and see walls melt and stuff like that. But thujone, and here's the important part, along with other chemical compounds and along with alcohol, this is the key to everything, does in fact have a very different effect than alcohol alone. Uh, it makes your eyes very sensitive to light. And this is, this is a fact. It just does it. Um, and strangely, rather than slurring your speech or impairing your motor skills, you become remarkably awake and lucid and talkative and, people argue, creative as well. Um, and hence, the very strong connections to art, the ability to create art while under the influence of this, um, is something that is, uh, that is not to be denied. It's, it's, a, it's a real thing. Um, it is arguably also, the word that's used to describe this effect is synesthetic. Syn meaning with and aesthetic means to, to feel something. So the opposite of anesthetic means you can't feel something. This is synesthesia, which means that the perceptions of the senses cross over. Now, now this actually happens in some people naturally, oddly enough. Um, but under the influence of absinthe, you can begin to hear color smell, texture, taste, sound. I know that sounds quite absurd, but what happens is the, basically the wirings in your brain get crossed up. And you see something and you associate it with a flavor, or you see something and, and, and think of a sound associated with it. And it's, it's also widely um, considered to be an aphrodisiac as well. I don't think any, there's any scientific evidence for that. But it does profoundly heighten your senses in very interesting ways. So it's stimulating. It's a, um, in, in, you could argue, also an erotic sense, just as it is um, to your senses. Um, it intensifies your experience. So, so in that respect, it doesn't, doesn't cause you to, to uh, perform better or to feel better, but it, but it, but it certainly does uh, heighten your emotional uh, perception of what's happening. Now, there are people, um, Ted Bro, Bro is, is one of the more infamous, he's uh, um, actually responsible for some very good absinthe in this country, but he's, um, he argues that thujone has absolutely no effect on the body, or that it's in such a small dosage in modern day absinthe that, um, and even, even in fact, if you analyze bottles that still exist from the 19th century before it was banned, um, the thujone, um, uh, it really doesn't have, have that much, even if, if it has a lot, it's not going to have much effect on you. Um, and the odd thing is, and the fact is, that thujone is still actually measured and regulated. The U.S. government has a minimum, uh, sorry, has a maximum thujone level allowed uh, in absinthe sold in the U.S. So whether it's true or not, the U.S. government thinks it is, okay? And they, they regulate the quantity. So the stuff you'll buy in Europe does have higher thujone level in it. Than the stuff here. Now, I don't know whether the people who sell their absinthe here are arguing Thujon makes no difference because they can't sell, sell it with a whole lot in it. But, um, but I've tasted both. I don't think there is so much of a difference um, between, you know, between the ones you buy in Europe and here. There are some great ones in Europe, don't get me wrong, but I think we, 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 we do buy the real thing here as well. Um, now the fact is there has been practically no experimental research into the effects of Thujon. Uh, in the 70s, there was a series of experiments that suggested that thujone acted on the brain very much like THC, uh, and these have been subsequently proven false, and it doesn't behave like THC in any way. Um, the high is completely, in fact, it's exactly opposite to marijuana. Marijuana kind of slurs you and you get, you know, um, really slow down, right? Um, and this, I think, may account for the fact why the U.S. government is still kind of worried about it is because there's no there's been no systematic uh, experiments about how it works, what it's actually doing to the brain. Um, no one really knows that for sure. Um, and so it may actually be a combination of lots of different chemicals, not just thujone. Um, and whatever it is, um, it is also, of course, the very high alcohol content. So if you drink this as you would any other cocktail, if you're drinking 
at least twice as much, if not more. Uh, and I think the one that I'm drinking, this is Pernod, which is really one of the oldest in the country. Um, this is, I can't even find the percentage on it. Um, nope, can't find it anywhere. It should be here. Oh, 68%. So that's, um, you know, a lot more <laughs> than most, most alcohol out there. So there's also a whole lot of rarefied paraphernalia uh, involved in the consumption. And, it, and in fact, it is ritualized, like, like um, in a way that many, very few other drinks are. It's normally consumed by pouring absinthe in a, in a glass like this, a conical absinthe glass, dribbling ice water from a special tank and fountain, much more elegantly than I did with a, a glass, uh, over the sugar cube. This is called the, the method, uh, French method. You just say method, it just means this is the way they do it in France. Um, some people soak the sugar cube in some of the absinthe and set it on fire. This is supposedly called the bohemian method, but it's ridiculous because you're just wasting the alcohol then. There's really no point in doing that. The flame looks kind of nice, but it's kind of stupid to, to waste alcohol that way. Um, and the dribbling water, as you saw in here in this experiment, um, is a louche, L-O-U-C-H-E, that are... Um, opalescent. If you do it really well and carefully and you have a light shining underneath, you see the, the sort of green swirls that look like opals. It's, it's really light through opal. Um, this is the green fairy. And at the very end, of course, you know, mine is a little little, water, little mix now, so you get a kind of cloudy drink. Um, this will become more cloudy if I uh, swirled it up. Um, and you can dilute it actually up to 50% with water. P people often do that. I did um, about a third or less. Um, and there are some people who prefer it without sugar and even without the drip. And I think, in all honesty, an ice cube works best in this. And in fact, so that's what I'm going to do as long as I'm sitting here and I got some ice cubes. I'm gonna pop one in. You'll see that it will re as the ice melts. Can you see that happening? Actually, right at the top there. The clouds are coming back into it. This is the, the um, sort of things that are in suspension in the alcohol. When they add it to water, they, they come out. I don't know exactly what it is, but, um, and, uh, Everyone will tell you absinthe was invented somewhere around 1792 in Switzerland in this Val du Travers uh, by a guy named Pierre Ordinaire. Anything but. It's extraordinaire, no? But we know that um, Artemisia absinthum was put into wine, actually, even by the ancient Greeks. It was a flavoring. It was a medicine. It went to, into aquavitae mixtures right from the very start of distillation, just like juniper went into uh, some of the early... Uh, modern and, and even late medieval uh, concoctions. Um, the, uh, for example, there's a reference to distilled water of absinthium. Again, I just randomly looked for this stuff and found it uh, in John Parkinson's Theatrum Botanicum, which is published in 1640. He's talking about something that's, that's basically absinthe, right? He says you rub this on the temple and it's used to purge noxious humors and actually, now that I think about it, <laughs> it's very cooling and lovely. So all my noxious humors are being purged now. Um, so it, like lots of other herbal concoctions, it was a medicine, right? So, and remains so by and large when the recipe was passed through several hands to a major Dubier who opened a factory in 1797 with his son uh, and son-in-law whose name was Henri Louis no. So this is so this is the old one. This is you know the uh, I don't think it's the best by any stretch of the imagination. But Pernod became the company name uh, down to this day. It's still made under that name, and we'll see that it the 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 sub drink actually changes dramatically, and now it's gone back to the original. But I'll I'll explain why. Um, so absinthe, at least a mass manufactured form, uh, comes is a largely a nineteenth century phenomenon. That's that's the height of its popularity is the eighteen um, hundreds. And I mean strictly so, since um, for most of the 20th century, uh, absinthe was banned in, in most of Europe and in the US. Um, you couldn't buy absinthe. So I'll, and I'll explain why that happened, which is really a, a fascinating story. So um, to start, it was given as a sort of quasi-medicinal drunk to stave off malaria among French soldiers in Algeria. Remember, Algeria was a French colony, and they were given this to prevent malaria which increased its popularity. People kind of came back from the French Foreign Legion and said um, that they wanted absinthe to drink. And um, 
The fact is that most French people didn't want it. They wanted wine. They drank wine. Wine drinking nation always had been. Um, and they drank it regularly and actually fairly abstemiously. You know, in, in the terms of the culture, there's not a culture of drunkenness the way, you know, we saw in, with vodka in the Russia. Um, but all this changed with industrialization and with the proliferation of cheap alcohol. Remember that cognac was not only export, uh, you know, really expensive, but it was all exported. So the, um, but more importantly than that, what really gives absinthe the leg up, so to speak, in the market is the phylloxera epidemic. And we'll come back to this topic, P-H-Y-L-L-O-X-E-R-A, -E phylloxera, um, which wipes out the French wine industry in the 1870s. Uh, so naturally, they, people wanted something to drink. They didn't have wine. Qu'est-ce qu'un buffet? And they went to um, a grain-based distilled spirit, um, which was still fairly inexpensive, right? Because they were not, um, people didn't drink, you know, unlike cognac, this is easy to make, it's cheap, it's, it's just a uh, rock cut, more or less. So the heyday of absinthe, when it's really, really popular, is when French people can't get wine, and neither, of course, can anyone else in Europe, for that matter, um, is from 1870 to 1917. That's the, the key date. Um, and it's, so, its associations are with uh, fin de siècle, that means end of century, um, decadence, sensuality, and, and even depravity, okay? Because we'll, we're talking uh, supposedly at the end of each century, uh, people go a little um, berserk, let's say, <laughs> because of anxiety. I don't know what it is, but it's, um, but it's certainly a, a kind of aesthetic of weirdness that pervades culture in the very end of the 19th century. So let's think of the figures who were popular at the time. Um, Oscar Wilde, you know, the, the, the playwright, uh, if you've seen The Importance of Being Earnest, or Lady Windermere's fan, or The Portrait of Dorian Gray. Um, he was a serious absinther, absinteur, um, let's say. So he says, after the first glass, you see things as you wish they were. After the second, you see things as they are not. And finally, you see things as they really are which is the most horrible thing in the world. And usually the quote ends there, but let me continue on with it. He says, how do you mean, asked Leverson. I mean disassociated. Take a top hat. You think you see it as it really is, but you don't because you associate it with other things and ideas. And if you've never heard of one before and suddenly saw it, you'd be frightened or laugh. Uh, that's the effect that absinthe has, and that is why it drives men mad. So, so he's assuming it really does do that. Well, we'll see by the end of this lecture, right? Um, that's the most famous absinthe quote. Usually the latter half is cut off, but it's, um, it appears in um, um, none of his write, actual writings. This is, this is reported by other people. But, uh, so he may not even have actually said that, but, but it's, uh, it's attributed to him, uh, as is also the, um, this, this quote. Absinthe has a wonderful color, green. A glass of absinthe is as poetical as anything in the world. What difference is there between a glass of absinthe and a sunset? You can, you can see that sort of approaching the, the um, synesthetic experience that I was talking about. So absinthe becomes the quintessential drink of down-and-out bohemians. As one observer put it, the sickly odor of absinthe lies heavily in the air. The absinthe hour of the boulevard begins vaguely at half past five, and it ends just as vaguely at half past seven. But on the hill, meaning Montmartre, with where all the Bohemians hang out, it never ends. Not that it is a home of the drunkard in any way, but the deadly opal drink lasts longer than anything else. And it is the aim of Montmartre to stop as long as possible on the ter terrace of a cafe and watch the world go by. To spend an hour in a really typical haunt of the Bohemians is a liberal education. I'm still quoting here. There is none of the reckless gaiety of the Latin Quarter, but at the same time, there is a grim delight in chaffing at death and bankruptcy. So the whole idea chaffing means you're going, Puh, to you, I'm going to just drink this and let the world go by anyway. So let's, let's look at some of the... Um, poets and painters of this era, because there is actually no other drink that is so firmly associated to a particular time and place, um, and a whole aesthetic sensibility um, that manifests itself in all the arts, okay? Not, not just 
painting and poetry, but music and um, and but let's start start with some of the the more famous poets because these are really uh, complete absenters. There's the uh, French symbolists. There's Verlaine and Rimbaud. So V E R L A I N E and Rimbaud is R I M B A U D are in fact directly inspired by absinthe. So let's start with one of the most celebrated and deranged of this lot, who just happens to um, written what I think is one of the best poems on earth. <laughs> so I will read it to you. And actually, I want to read it in both French and, and English because the sound of it in French is actually kind of lovely. And um, it is, uh, he's, this is Charles Baudelaire, okay? You know about the, um, he's a one perverted, sick person, but, but, it's, but this poem, I think, captures his spirit very much. So, enivrez-vous, il faut être toujours ivre. Uh, is get drunk, one must always be drunk, okay? Tout est là, c'est l'unique question pour ne sentir l'horrible fardeau du temple qui brise vos épaules et vous penche vers la terre. Il faut vous enivrer sans trêve. Mais de quoi? Du vin, du poésie, du vertu à votre guise. Mais enivrez-vous. Et si quelquefois sur les marches d'un palais, sur l'herbe verte d'un fossé, dans la solitude morne de votre chambre, vous vous réveillez, l'ivresse déjà diminuée ou disparue, demandez au vent, à la vague, à l'étoile, à l'oiseau, à l'horloge, à tout ce qui fuit, à tout ce qui gémit, à tout ce qui roule, à tout ce que je chante, à tout ce que je parle, demandez quelle heure il est, et le vent, le vague, l'étoile, l'oiseau, l'horloge vous répondront. Il est l'heure son ivre. Let, let me read the English because you're getting bored with this. So, so it's not to feel the horrible burden of time which bruises your shoulders and grinds you into the dirt. You must get drunk without rest. But on what? Wine? poetry, virtue, what you will, but get drunk. And if some time in the halls of a palace or on the green ravine, in the morning solitude of your chamber when you wake up, if your drunkenness diminishes or disappears, then ask the wind, the waves, the star, the bird, the clock, everything that flies, everything that groans, everything that rolls, everything that sings, everything that speaks, and ask, what time is it? And the wind, the waves, the star, the bird, the clock will all respond. It's time to get drunk. So as not to be the martyred slaves of time, get drunk, get drunk without cease with wine, poetry, or virtue, what you will. So let's move from that lovely thing to uh, Paul Verlaine, who is, um, I guess, the most infamous absinthe drinker. Uh, it was clear that it pretty much did ruin his life, um, seems to have led to what were, by all accounts, rather violent outbursts on his part. Um, he tried to set his wife on fire. Uh, he shot his fellow poet, Rambo. He attacked his own mother with a knife when he needed money, for which uh, he went to prison for this. And pretty much everything he did was apparently inspired by his addiction to absinthe. And in fact, he used to greet people by saying, hello, I take sugar with it. <laughs> <laughs> assuming that they're going to hand him a glass immediately. Um, and he became a permanent fixture of the Latin Quarter, this old, weird, eccentric satyr who would, people would come and visit him half for inspiration and half to gawk at him. He used to just hang out in, in uh, cafes and, and bars and people would come and look and uh, see him. But his, his poetry is actually kind of bizarre and marvelous. Um, it was set to um, the Claire de Lune, which, which was playing when I started, is, was set to music by Claude Debussy, but it's, it's by Verlaine. It'll give you an, an excellent impression of the aesthetic of this era. Its mood is very evocative, and it communicates not through words. The words are almost meaningless, actually. It communicates through the symbols of the words and the sounds. And let me see if I can, um, oh, I can't pull it up again, but you will, we'll listen to Claire de Lune in, in class, certainly. Uh, and it's very easy to find if you just go on YouTube. So. Uh, that's called Debussy. So uh, let me read the words to you, though. This is what that piece of music is based on. Your soul is a chosen landscape where charming masqueraders and bergamaskers go playing the lute and dancing and almost sad beneath their fantastic disguises. They all sing in a minor key. 
about triumphant love and fortunate life. They do not seem to believe in their fortune and their song blends with the light of the moon. In the calm moonlight, sad and beautiful, which has the birds dreaming in the trees and the fountains sobbing in ecstasy and the tall fountains slender amid marble statues. So it's got this weird kind of dreamy, spooky kind of air to it. Um, and if you listen to the song, it's it's very, very much, it's not even in a key, it's in a, in a, um, a whole tone scale, which gives it this really otherworldly sound. It's, it's lovely. So the other absent Franker is uh, Arthur Rimbaud, R-I-M-B-A-U-D, is uh, the 16-year-old protege and actually part-time for a while lover of Verlaine. Uh, I think he went much farther than Baudelaire on the topic of poetic inspiration, thinking not only did one need to be drunk, but one needed to be completely deranged to be a good artist, to to break from society's expectations and its um, constrictions, as you had to be completely outside of the cultural norms of your society. Uh, I'll read this to you. This is by um, Rambo. Um, the poet must make himself a seer by long and reasoned derangement of the senses. So in order to really understand things, you can't look at things the way you normal people do. You have to consciously mess up, mess with them. Um, the artistic sensibilities should be roused, he thought, by drugs, by perfumes, and even poisons taken by the Sybil. Sybil is a person who sees into the future. To do that, you've got to take drugs. It gives you a kind of extrasensory understanding and ability to see. Um, and he was a, you know, not just a revolutionary in artistic terms, he was a madman. Okay, there's no, no doubt about that. He would disrupt poetry, go into poetry readings, and at the end of every line, he would shout out, Merd, <laughs> after, the, after, you know, someone's reading a poem. Merd means shit, okay? So, um, and once he told um, Verlaine to put your hand on the table because I want to try an experiment. So Verlaine put his hand down, and he um, slashed across his hand with a knife just to see what would happen. Another occasion, he had dropped sulfuric acid in a companion's beer. So he's, he's crazy, okay? There's no, no doubt about that. But um, here's an example of his verse, and I'll let you be the judge of, of it. Um, Come, the wines go to the beaches and the waves by the millions. See the wild bitter rolling from the top of the mountains. Let us, wise pilgrims, reach the absinthe with the green pillars. And his poetry is not just weirdly impressionistic, but it is symbolist, meaning that the things don't have literal meaning. They have this kind of symbolic power to move your emotions, um, but no actual literal meaning, as far as I can tell. Um, the imagery, it's very bizarre imagery, and, and he actually directly influences the Surrealist movement. Surrealism follows, you know, Dali and people like that follow directly after these symbolists. Um, now, what is weird is he stopped writing at age about 20, and he disappeared into obscurity, and no one really understands what happened to him. But in any case, let me read you just a little, little bit of Rimbaud. This is called The Drunken Boat. As I was floating down unconcerned rivers, I no longer felt myself steered by the haulers. Gaudy redskins had taken them for targets, nailing them to naked, nailing them naked to colored stakes. I cared nothing for all my crews, carrying Flemish, wheat, or English cottons, when along with my haulers whose uproars were done with, the rivers let me sail downstream where I pleased. Into the ferocious tide rips, last winter more absorbed than the minds of children, I ran, and the unmoored peninsulas, never enduring more triumphant clamorings, the storm made bliss of my seaborne awakenings. Lighter than a cork, I danced on the waves which men call eternal rollers of victims for 10 nights without once missing the foolish eye of the harbor lights. Sweeter than the flesh of sour apples to children, the green water penetrated my pine wood hull and washed me clean of the bluish wine stains and splashes of vomit, carrying away both rudder and anchor. And from that time I bathed in the poem of the sea, star infused and churned into milk devouring the green azures where entranced in pallid flotsam a dreaming drowned man sometimes goes down where suddenly dying the blue bluenesses deliriums and slow rhythms under the gleams of daylight stronger than alcohol vaster than music ferment the bitter redness of love it's meaningless 
as far as I can tell. But but um, you can see all the weird absinthe symbols in there of the, and in the description, right? So the absinthe um, profoundly affected the artists of the period. And I want you to stop now, actually, and I want you to look at Edouard Manet, M-A-N-E-T, painting of 1859, which is called The Absinthe Drinker. Okay, just take a look at this for a second. We'll come back. So what's strange about it is it is weirdly detached. There's no sympathy for the subject at all. There's no moral to be told. It's just depicting, here it is, here's what, what, what I see. And I think the, the importance of these group of people, this whole generation of artists rejected the ac academic style which had, you know, sort of, um, how can I describe it? Lots of sweet nymphs and beautiful women and, and naked bodies. Um, actually, if you go to, go to um, the Hagen Museum, it's, it's actually right over there, <laughs> it's right through this window, it's on the other side of the park, um, is um, um, Bouguereau's, uh, um, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's a nymphaeum, it's basically lots of nymphs on swings and in the pond, and it's, and it's, it's lovely to look at, but it's, that's the academic style of the mid 19th century. Uh, wildly popular. Um, uh, so these guys wanted to kind of shock society by showing the grime and the dirt and the filth and the, the order, you know, very much like Emile Zola did in The Belly of Paris, if you've ever read that um, novel about the, uh, the marketplace. Um, and so the, they wanted to show industrial Paris at its lowest and so most sordid. And so, you know, um, you know, it's weird because the absent third, you know, this guy's a rag picker, basically, and he wants to show this weird kind of nobility in his stance. And I think if you look at the generation of, of painters, this, these are, of course, the Impressionists, largely. Um, they, you know, they want the impression of the painting, not, not to be exact reality. They became obsessed with theaters, bars, prostitutes, drunks, bums, and that's, you know, mid, that's um, very much the aesthetic of the day. Uh, and I think no one captures better this time and place than Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, who was, um, um, as weird as they come, <laughs> a fellow painter said his paintings were entirely painted in absinthe. Um, he's another one of these famous absinthers. He's one of those figures you find wandering around Montmartre to the Moulin Rouge, and apparently had a cane that was hollowed out and filled with absinthe that he could drink any time he wanted. Um, and his... Favorite cocktail was called the Tremblement du Terre, which is a means an earthquake. It's a combination of absinthe and cognac. Heart be still. Um, there's also a drink made with absinthe and, and wine, uh, red wine in the case of absinthe vidangeur, which is a scavenger's ab absinthe, um, which was apparently the favorite color, a favorite of the singer in the red scarf and the black hat that, that, uh, that uh, Toulouse-Lautrec always depicts. It's what she liked to drink. So um, now let's think of another great absinthe there, a little, little later, is, um, is Eric Satie. So what I want you to do now, and, and this is, you know, it's pointless for me to record it if it's, you can find the recording, but this is um, another inveterate absinthe in the same fin de siècle cloud. And I want you to listen to Gymnopedi one. Okay, Gymno uh, Pedi, I don't know what that means, Naked Feet? <laughs> it's Jim, G-Y-M-N-O-P-E-D-I-E-S-1. -E and the guy's, the composer's name is Eric, with a K, S-A-T-I-E, Sati. So we'll listen to it now. And then we come back to Alfred Jarry, who is the author of the surrealist play Ubu Ra, was also obsessed with completely abandoning yourself to hallucinatory dreams brought on by absinthe, which he called holy water. <laughs> it's rather blasphemous, but lovely. Uh, he also thought it be, should be drunk straight. Um, he said, anti-alcoholics are unfortunate in the grip of water, that terrible poison so solvent and corrosive that out of all substances it has been chosen for washing and scouring, and a drop of water added to clear liquid like absinthe just muddles it. Um, <laughs> which, it's against, you know, um, he's, he's saying that about water, of course. It's every, you know, put metal in water, it corrodes. And alcohol, no, of course it's better for you. So, in any case, he wrote everything that he, he wrote uh, intoxicated, and he appears to have not just written about 
the movement that is called absurdism, but he seems to have actually lived it. He was a living example of a person who was completely absurd in, in every way. Um, he rode everywhere on a bicycle. He ate all of his meals backwards. He painted his face green, or he'd wear a paper shirt with a tie drawn on instead of a real one. He always carried a gun, and the story goes that when someone asked for directions, he said, um, please step back six paces and ask that question, and took out his gun and pointed it at the guy's head. Um, he kept owls, he uh, had a little marionette theater in his house, and as a complete union of art and life, um, he actually drank himself to death. Um, and I think uh, the story of Alfred Jerry really needs to be told in a movie, and damn it, it's gotta be Johnny Depp doing it, playing him, it, because he looks just like him too, which is really weird. Um, so in any case, another of these absent tours of this generation, Aleister Crowley, um, not just an, a, a great imbiber, but a dabbler in the occult, known as the uh, the wickedest man in the world, wrote this, uh, uh, La Legende d'Absinthe, The Legend of Absinthe. So let me read you a little bit. That's what the hell. Apollo, mourning the demise of Hyacinth, would not cede victory to death. He, his soul, adept of transformation, had to find a holy alchemy for beauty. So from his celestial hand, he exhausts and crushes the subtlest gifts from divine flora. Their broken bodies sigh with golden exhalation from which he harvests our first drop of absinthe, like crushing the wormwood, okay? And they're sighing, oh. In crouching cellars and sparkling palaces, alone or together, drink that potion of loving, for it is sorcery, conjuration. This pale opal wine aborts misery, opens the intimate sanctuary of beauty, bewitches my heart, exalts my soul in ecstasy. So, and I think perhaps the most intriguing theory that I have read about recently is the effect of absinthe on Vincent van Gogh, or van Gogh, if you want to say his name properly. Um, his madness and his use of color and technique, apparently influenced by the things he saw in an absinthe-soaked haze. Um, and of course, he long suffered from serious mental illness also, but he, um, but people like to think absinthe sort of pushed him over the edge and gave him this ability to see colors in a completely different way. Um, and um, apparently he was he was addicted actually not just to, to alcohol or absinthe, but, but to anything with terpene. So he used to drink turpentine and things like that. Um, and of course it killed him after, of course, he cut his ear off. Um, but I want you to, to look closely at a painting. We'll, we'll look at this in class as well, but let's look at a still life with absinthe. Okay, this is Vincent van Gogh. And I also want you to look at what is probably the most famous painting having to do with absinthe. This is Edgar Degas, D-E-G-A-S, painted in 1876. Um, and there are many different ideas about what this may mean. It's, is it, you know, critical of the absinthe craze? Is it a picture of poverty and dejection? I'm really not sure, so I want to, want to talk about this in class, but it is um, actually the actress Ellen André and her friend, a bohemian printmaker, so they're not actually real people, they're posing. Um, and she's dressed fairly nicely, and the place isn't exactly sordid, right? It's not a dump, but it's, um, it's La Nouvelle Athene, which is a bar that's actually still there in Paris. Um, I don't know, maybe he just wants to show truth as it appears to the artist. I'm, I'm not really sure what's going on there, but obviously she is really dejected. She's isolated from the guy next to her, and of course that is one effect that alcohol can have, right? It's, it it uh, makes you um, isolated. And so maybe, you know, I'm, many people have said, oh, this is a very clear example of the uh, neuroses brought on by modern anomi and alienation and... That's why they they should be having a lot of fun, and they're not. Clearly, they're just sitting there getting drunk and drinking absinthe and depressed. So, um, now the irony of the whole thing, weirdly enough, is, is again the woman is um, is an actress. <laughs> Degas is just depicting her as a drunk. She's modeling. It's not not a not she's not a real person. And then in the course of this wild absinthe craze, um, there were of course serious detractors too. They, I'm going to talk about some of them because they're they're ultimately why absinthe gets um, 
expand. There is a Marie Corelli, who I think is probably the most dreadful novelist I've ever read anything of, written by um, 19, late 19th century. She wrote this play called um, Absinthe, A Drama of Paris. This came out in 1890, again, to defame the, the, the drink. Uh, wildly popular, but the um, book was uh, printed in London. Uh, it's a story of a guy who falls in love with a girl and she loves someone else. So he says, I, he turns to a bohemian lifestyle, which means you get a crummy apartment, you live poor, you eat garbage, drink a lot, great art, okay? And he meets this crazy artist who introduces him to absinthe. He says, ah, I want some absinthe. And he becomes addicted to it, of course. And it turns out the other guy, um, the, the guy who the girl is mar uh, you know, in love with goes and becomes a priest. So the two people can marry. And the day before he's supposed to get married to this woman he loves, he goes on an absinthe so binge. And, uh, and let me read it to you because it's, it's, it's so awful. Um, that night, the night before my wedding day, I drank deeply of my favorite nectar. Glass after glass I prepared and drained each one off with insatiable and ever-increasing appetite. I drank till the solid walls of my room, when at last I found myself there, appeared to me like transparent glass shot through with emerald flame, surrounded on all sides by phantoms, beautiful, hideous, angelic, devilish. I reeled to my couch in a sort of waking swoon, conscious of strange sounds everywhere, like the clanging of brazen bells and the silver fanfaronade trumpets of war. Um, now, as I said, the absinthe will not make you hallucinate, but it was sources like this that kind of cemented the reputation of absinthe as a hallucinogenic. But clearly the author had never tried this stuff. You do not have visions, <laughs> nothing like that at all. So the story ends up with him uh, denouncing the girl um, under the paranoid assumption that she is the priest's mistress. They both end up in the slums poor and the protagonist eventually uh, strangles the priest and throws his body in the Seine. <laughs> So it's, you know, it's meant to be melodramatic and, and horror and dire lesson for people who would drink absinthe. I mean, when Oscar Wilde read this play, he actually read it from his prison cell um, in Reading Jail, where he wrote the great ballad of Reading Jail. It's, um, he said, now, I don't think I have anything against her moral character, but from the way she writes, she ought to be in here, meaning in jail. <laughs> so uh, very, very, very astute uh, judge of her literary merit. So, another poem. I don't even know what this is, but I found it. Um, this is, I am the green fairy. My robe is the color of despair. I have nothing in common with fairies of the past. What I need is blood, red and hot. The palpitating flesh of my victims. Alone, I will kill France. The present is dead. Vive la future. But me, I kill the future, and in, my, uh, in family I destroy the love of country, courage, honor. I am the purveyor of hell, penitentiaries, hospitals. Finally, who am I? I am the instigator of crime. I am ruin and sorrow. I am shame. I am dishonor. I am death. I am absinthe. So, a whole lot of nonsense. So, uh, so I want you to just, just accept that, you know, there's, there's a group of people who are very absinthe soaked and all great artists who we still revere today and then there's this whole kind of uh, weird undercurrent of, um, of critical literature that is trying to defame absinthe saying it's making people crazy and killing them um, Albert Mag Magnon's Green Muse in 1895 is, um, is also pretty critical it's a seductive fairy tempts the poet into thinking he's really inspired and then um, but look at the the, the um, malicious look on her face. This is a painting, by the way, I'm sorry. It's um, called The Green Muse, 1895. Take a look at this also. And then um, there is the uh, Emile Zola's novel, La Sommoir, was uh, very influential about alcoholism in general, I guess. Though there's a very interesting passage about absinthe. Um, I'll, I'll read it. Bosch has known a joiner who has stripped himself stark naked in the Rue Saint-Martin and died doing the polka. He was an absinthe drinker. Um, and, you know, Zola, being the stark realist of the day, has probably seen something like this and wanted to depict it, uh, to warn people, of course. So even though there was a great deal of negative press and opinion, what could have happened that signaled 
such a an outcry greater than that of the um, gin craze in the 18th century that completely turned the tide of opinion against absinthe. Um, I think the timing is very interesting. This would not and could not have happened so quickly without mass communication. And if you remember in the era of gin, it was newspapers and prints, broadside prints like Hogarth's. Um, by, by the turn of the, the 20th century, we're talking about um, um, mass, mass communication very shortly, of course, radio and movies and TV and things like that in the 20th century. But I don't think it would have happened unless people could have found out about this in the news tabloids very, very quickly, all over the place. Um, and uh, only could a tragedy like this have been publicized and led to such a rapid change of policy. So this happens, well, let me tell you the story. It's, it's August 1905. A 31-year-old man by the name of Jean Lanfray had two glasses of absinthe. That's not a whole lot. Um, took out his rifle and shot his pregnant wife in the head. Went and then killed their four-year-old daughter, Rose, and then their two-year-old daughter, Blanche. This really happened. Okay. He then passed out before he could manage to shoot himself. That was presumably the intention. And of course, all the headlines said that absinthe led this man to homicidal rage. Now, we tend to be a little... Um, we're used to shit like this happening all the time, right? So we don't, we see it on the news and we go, oh yeah, of course, another one. Um, back then, this was entirely bizarre, terrifying to people, and they blamed absinthe for, for the whole um, thing. And the headlines, of course, you know, I'll just say absinthe leads man to homicidal rage. Um, what they left out also is that the man had also drank a creme de menthe, a cognac, six glasses of wine, various other spirits, and that normally he drank five liters of wine and was was mentally ill to start with. Okay, they, they just left all that part out. He was blind, stinking drunk, of course. It wasn't the two glasses of absinthe. But absinthe was the culp culprit, and the backlash was ten times the furor over gin in the 18th century. Again, because of the newspapers. Now, within a year, one year, people start pushing legislation to ban absinthe. Uh, it was banned in its homeland, which is Switzerland. And it's actually the only alcohol ever to be banned on its own. Okay, there's been prohibition, of course, which bans all alcohol, but this is the only time that a single alcohol type had been banned. Um, in the United States, it happened in 1912. In France, it happened in 1915. Also, very, very quickly, uh, most of Europe also banned it. Um, very interestingly, Britain never did, never got around to banning it. It was never popular there. So I think it was just very difficult to get once the French, uh, what the French did is they take this stuff, they take out the wormwood with the, um, with the Thujon in it, Thujon gets the blame, and they call it pastis, which is a very close related drink, but no wormwoods. And Pernod stayed in business making pastis, very good pastis. Um, you can buy it, it's not expensive at all. Um, this stuff cost a fortune. This was about $90 for this one bottle. So, um, and so the, uh, you know, uh, the companies that made um, absinthe switched to Pastis, Pernod, Ricard also is another one. Um, and another very strange thing, which I've never really been able to explain, is Spain never banned it. Um, there are some brands that have been made continuously. Deva, Marimayan, they're not fabulous, and they're very, very hard to find now. They were, they were the ones that people used to buy um, back in the, well, 20 years ago, when people got interested in absinthe again and you could, and it was still illegal in the U.S., those are the brands that they found. Or they found um, Czech absinthe. And what is really weird is um, the, in the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia then, I guess, um, there was, um, Prague suddenly opened up as a tourist destination in the 80s, and everyone went there and said, ooh, we have to try absinthe because it never had it before. Green mouthwash, the most horrible, <laughs> nasty stuff I've ever tasted uh, there. Um, revolting and nothing like, like real absinthe. But that was the first one that people in, in Western, called, you know, in the Western Europe and America first tasted was, was Czech absinthe. And no wonder they hated it. So there were a few companies, um, in, let's say, illegally selling absinthe unlabeled in the U.S., um, in the 90s. Um, one very, very interesting woman. Maybe I shouldn't mention her name. She's still around, but she, um, Betty Whittles was her name. She had, uh, she was in Arizona, and uh, what someone realized is that if it were channeled through 
um, it was never illegal in Britain. So if they channeled it through Britain and then shipped it to the US in unlabeled bottles, there was no way anyone could trace it. It was just like private mail. Um, and, and it used to be, you know, really, really good selection. It was, um, oh, I don't know, maybe $150 a bottle back then, many of which went to my office in WPC, believe it or not, 20 years ago, no, in the 90s, let's say. Um, the, uh, and then, then this company um, was formed called Liqueur de France, which was, uh, had a great selection. It's still around, actually, Liqueurs of France, basically. But it was, it was, they were buying up absinthe, channeling it through Britain, and selling it in the U.S. Now, it's, a, it's legal now, okay? The, uh, in 2007, this is only, not even a decade ago, the ban was lifted in the United States, um, and all of a sudden, they could legally import it and sell it in stores. Now, I think, in all honesty, the allure is now gone. Half the fun of it was that it was illegal, and you had to really try hard to find it. Um, and, but since then, um, there are absinths produced in the U.S., and actually some that have uh, rather wide acclaim. Um, nonetheless, um, also very good brands are available. In fact, anywhere you can buy clandestine, which is just about as good as absinthe gets. Um, our Bevmo in Stockton has it in a little bottle. Um, expensive, but it's good. Uh, Lucid is also very good. Kubler, you, which is a German absinthe, you can find pretty much anywhere, which is also um, rather good. And, um, and St. George made right here in Alameda, which is, it's decent. I think it's, it's okay. Um, there's also Mansinth by Marilyn Manson. Um, and, and so this kind of absinthe renaissance just exploded uh, after about 2010 or so. And uh, a couple of really bad ones have come out also. Um, just look carefully on the label. If you see something like absent or whatever, it means that it doesn't actually have wormwood in it. And it's not really absinthe. There's a, there's a handful of brands like that now that are um, fakes. Well, they're not fakes, they're just not absinthe. Why, you know, they have a picture of Van Gogh on the label and doesn't seem double and everything. It's not absinthe, but why you'd buy that now that it's legal, I have no idea. Um, there is also, I should mention, and if you are in New Orleans, the first thing you should do is head directly to the old Absinthe Bar, which is right on Bourbon Street, opened in 1874 by Gaetano Ferrer. Um, now, why do I say go there? Well, Mark Twain writes, that has been there. Uh, Oscar Wilde was there. FDR took his Absinthe there, but I don't know how he did that because it was illegal at the time. But there is... Um, its greatest fame, in my opinion, is if you walk in and you look very closely and you kind of ignore the, the football helmets hanging from the ceiling and stuff, you'll notice that the cover of In Through the Outdoor, Led Zeppelin, is filmed there. And if you, they'll take you into the room to show you that if you ask. And it's very clearly that, that room. Um, I think there's a guy with a hat and everything. It's a great album, of course. Um, so Zeppelin used to go there also. Um, and um, by chance, the last time I was there, I sat in that very spot that's on the, on the cover, which was very cool. So in any case, um, Absinthe has this very interesting artistic um, association that disappears completely for the 20th century. And what I'd be interested in is, um, you know, how is Absinthe really going to come back? Well, it's, you can find it in bars nowadays. People make very interesting Absinthe cocktails. Um, in, um, in Heidelberg, where I was a couple of weeks ago, there's a really, really superb, um, the largest selection of absinthe I've ever seen anywhere on earth. And he had maybe, I don't know, two or three hundred different absinthe there. <laughs> Let me taste some of them, which were fabulous. Um, and uh, so places like that exist, and it's becoming its own interesting subculture. Maybe not so much as, you know, in around 2010, in the wake of the making it legal again, but the fact that you can find it I found this in Stockton, believe it or not. I don't know whether that's a, a good thing or a bad thing, but um, if you have the wherewithal and you're legal, of course, you can, you can try it now if you like. Um, I would also say that there are a couple of cocktails that are really worth trying, and maybe I'll, I'll make one um, for our next lecture, but it's um, Ernest Hemingway came up with a cocktail called Death in the Afternoon, which is a... Uh, shot of absinthe and a glass of champagne, which, which is really, um, you're supposed to drink three to five of these very slowly. And that's how you, you know, he would write all morning and then uh, drink all afternoon. And that was how he was productive, I guess. Um, but I think my version is a little better. 
Um, the, the one, the addition that I have made to this, and actually it's a published recipe. It was published in a, in a book of drinks called um, 12 Bottle Bar, which is really fun. No, actually it's another drink that was, that was published there. But in any case, this is a drink where you take a, um, a Veuf Clicquot champagne, drizzle the absinthe into it, and then include a fresh lychee. It's called an opal eyeball. It's really, the, it's, it's, it's a great drink. It's one of my favorites. So I, I encourage you to uh, try it if you have the wherewithal. Um, don't buy the fake stuff and, um, and take a look. If you like, just to, just to get a sense of what's online, look at uh, Liqueur de France. And there's some remarkably amazing experiments that are being done to revive older recipes. And um, it's just an interesting piece of history, I think. Okay, so next time, I don't know what we're going to do next time. Maybe champagne, maybe soda. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Ciao.